Well, that was one factor. Then there, there, there was another factor, a psychological factor. By that time, they needed an explanation for this deep depression. And the, of course, the politicians hit upon the idea that Wall Street did it, finance did it, the speculators did it, Wall Street did it. You know? And therefore, there were lengthy and ugly denunciations, investigations of Wall Street. Now and then there was the SEC regulating Wall Street, prohibiting short sales and prohibiting margin buying and all this. There were tight political regulation of, of, of finance. Consequently, Wall Street, of course, collapsed. The finance retreated and therefore uh, it's not surprising that in, in all these accusations, denunciations of business, of the capitalists, of the speculators, that the finally uh, finance collapsed in 1937. And finally, I would like to come to the major point for which I usually name this phase. And this is the phase of labor relations, labor, labor situation changed radically. There was the Wagner Act which became effective in 1937. No, passed in 35, effective in 1937. That's, it's called, the proper term for this act is not the Wagner Act, it's the National Labor Relations Act, which took labor out of the courts of law, away from all courts, established a new federal agency, the National Labor Relations Board, appointed labor people to this board, you know, and uh, thus revolutionized labor relations. It also established five unfair practices for employers, employer unfair practices, whatever employers would do, they would be fined and arrested and jailed and, and fined again if they were to resist a labor union. In other words, and it introduced the system of, of bargaining, collective bargaining, as we know it today. Now, under the supervision of the National Labor Relations Board, there would be an election, and then the, then the a union would be certified as the sole bargaining agent by, by the National Labor Relations Board, and then the employers had to submit and yield and uh, deal with the labor unions. In short order, membership in unions rose from about 3 million to later to 16 million during the war and after the war. I, I'm talking about the 40s now, you know, it began, it rose from 3 million to 16 million, later in the late 50s, early 60s, even to 25 million membership in American labor unions. But the fact was, that by 1937, as a result of this act, at the beginning of this period, the beginning of this, this new labor relations situation, there were thousands of organizational strikes and thousands of sit-down strikes. In 1937, the labor unions in Michigan, for instance, they all seized the plants. The sit-down strike is a strike and the labor unions actually seized the company, seized the plants, and refused to vacate, you know, inflicting staggering losses on, on businesses, seizing the companies, inflicting losses, that it was not surprising that by 1937, business collapsed again. By in the winter of 37, 38, with unemployment more than 11 million, there was utter deep despair and depression in the land. And the situation remained like this practically until Pearl Harbor. I would like to mention one more act of 1938, which perpetuated the depression. This was the Wage and Hours Act. The Wage and Hours Act decreed that the work week which used to be at that time was still 46 hours of work week, was to be reduced by in stages to 44 hours, 42 hours, and 48, 40 hours at 46 hours pay, which again raised labor costs tremendously and made the employment of labor very expensive and therefore very 
and what about the reduction in the demand of labor and higher unemployment? As I mentioned, the depression continued. On the day of Pearl Harbor, on December 7, 1941, there were still nine and a half million were unemployed. Historians have been saying that FDR was hoping or scheming to get involved in the war as soon as possible. And thereafter, there was a draft of about 12 and a half million American men, which took care of the unemployment. My point is, my point is here, and that's why I'm presenting this, but that's why I was called upon to talk about this. My point is, it was not freedom and free enterprise failed, that failed during the 1930s. The 1930s, the Great Depression, are evidence of a kind of debacle of radical government intervention. Politics running wild in economic life from one insanity to another. That's the Great Depression. It's not freedom that failed. It was politics that was insane, nearly insane, incredibly harmful during those years. That's the lesson of the 1930s. And if we repeat these same policies, we'll have the same effects again. Let's reflect on this thought for a minute. How about, let's just go over these here, you know. How about today? Do we have this, the financial easy money? Yes, I think there's no doubt that we have this, these conditions, are always these ups and downs, these conditions are given. Do we have this, the disintegration of the world economy? Well, many are gnawing at it. And today, what's, what's so remarkable is that the Democrats, which used to be the trade party for free trade, the Republicans used to be the protectionists. When you listen now to the many Democratic leaders, they sound worse than the, the worst Republicans in the past. No? Today, there has been a reversal. The Republicans you know, in the White House, with Reagan in the White House, who has given us some measure of protectionism, yielded to steel and yielded to automobile, uh, have we given automobile industry some protection, some quotas in, in the bicycle industry and some others, they have received some protection by President Reagan. But the opposition wants more. So you, you ask yourself, is this given? I doubt that it's given in, at the extremes of 1930-31, but you, you are seeing it there, it's, it's, it's on the horizon. The third, is this given? No, the elimination of competition, regimentation of the economy. Oh, I, I don't think, not right now, not right now. It may come during the 1990s, may come as a result of all these huge deficits, our inability to pay, it may come. In my new book coming out next month on debts and deficits, I'm raising this question and I'm pointing at this, that this may come again, as a result of the debts and the deficits. You know. And finally, when it comes to this here, the, the combination of factors, and especially the labor situation, I don't see it either. I think labor unions have lost power in recent years. You know. Even membership has declined from some 25 million in the early 60s to right now probably 16, 17 million membership in American unions. And the power of unions has somewhat declined, but it's still there, it's still political, still heard, you know, and uh, potentially, uh, all potentially very powerful, uh, but uh, now, what, what's the, the biggest danger today to the United States if we rule this out as being so, so rampant and so potentially so disastrous? I think the present situation is the debt sit situation. This living far beyond our means internationally, domestically, no, or political institutions living far beyond their means, consuming our substance, grinding us into poverty. I think that's the danger, that's the cancer of our age. Not so much, you know, although we have this too, you know, and we have some of this and some of this, but I think in addition today, you have the, the debt situation. And the debt situation is very ominous. Well, that's uh, 
what I had in mind about the Great Depression. Let me repeat here. The Great Depression was not the result of the failure of, the failure of freedom and free enterprise. It was the ominous consequence of ominous economic political intervention in economic life. And if we do this again, we'll have the same effects again. ideas of freedom, as they relate to the meaning and the welfare of the individual, have been clearly expressed throughout time, from the ancient Greeks to our founding fathers, and now many voices among us today. But not so long ago, in the years just after World War II, the voices expressing the freedom philosophy were few and isolated. It was a low point for the philosophy of limited government, free markets, and a private property order. The array of forces proposing various forms of socialism and the welfare state were being heard everywhere. The case for individual freedom was virtually unknown. One man in particular saw the need to gather the voices of freedom to provide a broad-based institutional framework. And so, in 1946, the late Leonard E. Reed and a few of his friends organized the Foundation for Economic Education to bring coherence, structure, and life to the ideas of liberty before it was too late. As Leonard Reed and his friends so clearly perceived, socialism was on the increase, not because it was right, but because no alternative was being heard. Voices for the free society had no platform from which to offer a positive alternative that was consistent, easily understood, morally correct, and intellectually exciting. The Foundation has been a significant force in changing that situation. Over the last 40 years, more than any other organization, the Foundation, or fee as it is known to its friends, has acted as a first source, an introduction to the philosophy of freedom. While others have concentrated on policy studies, Fee has maintained a commitment to basic principles, the ideal concept, always making the connection between economic education, moral and spiritual development, self-improvement, and the philosophy of freedom. There has been a profound and telling change in the public awareness of freedom, both in the United States and around the world. Now the ideas of individual freedom of choice, limited government, a free market economy, and private property rights are again claiming our attention. Much of this success can be attributed to fee and to its effective efforts over the years in advancing the causes of liberty. Fee set in motion a chain of events and released a number of people in that chain of events and those, those people have made a significant impact on what we understand about freedom today. But what actually is fee? And how has it been so instrumental in giving new life to the freedom philosophy? First, fee is an ever-expanding circle of students of liberty, people from every sphere of life who seek to understand and practice the principles of the free market, private property, and limited government. These people then take the opportunity to impart to others the excitement of what they have learned. I truly believe that without economic freedom, there can be no personal freedom. And I think, if anything, that education uh, for me has come from from fee. Second, fee is the oldest of the freedom institutions, and it continues to be a leading voice for liberty, having affected more people and influenced more institutions and organizations than any other freedom enterprise. Third, fee is a committed board of trustees, featuring some of the most principled freedom devotees in America, people who study, 
practice and are dedicated to the philosophy of freedom. And fourth, Fee is a highly dedicated professional staff who coordinate a broad range of integrated programs. Programs like publishing. Some people supporting the freedom philosophy will find themselves more attracted to one rather than the other, but show the range and really be pointing out that the foundation is equipping people who belong to any one of these. Sound ideas are the most effective counter to the seemingly compassionate arguments of socialism. Part of Fee's mission is to discover and draw attention to the sound ideas and economic principles that underlie the free market through a large and expanding publishing program. Since January of 1956, the magazine The Freeman has been published by the Foundation on a monthly basis. This study journal has gone to thousands of individuals for the asking. The Freeman, originating under the supervision of Paul Perot, is the oldest of the journals written from a free market perspective. As a matter of fact, when virtually no one else was interested in advancing free market ideas, the Freeman was quietly presenting its case to students, teachers, clergymen, and business people. And Fee presents that case through longer, more in-depth publications like The Law by Frederick Bastiat, The Mainspring of Human Progress by Henry Grady Weaver, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, Anything That's Peaceful by Leonard Reed, Human Action by Ludwig von Mises, and hundreds of others. Over the years, Fee has sold or given away millions of copies of various publications. Prices, free market, prices, direct production. You know, once in a while you may wonder that in this capitalistic system without a central plan, without a central brains in washing, telling 200 million Americans what to do, and yet there's a marvelous order of things in economic life, a very rational economic order and without a central plan. And all this is achieved, accomplished, through the signal of price. Seminars. In the interest of more concentrated times of study, each year since 1952, hundreds of people have come to a wide-ranging program of fee seminars at Irvington, New York, as well as regionally throughout the country. In these focused times together, Fee staff and guest faculty give participants an in-depth look at the freedom philosophy or present the freedom perspective on some topical subject. Soon or late, concludes Keynes, it is ideas which are dangerous for good or evil. End of quote. These people, as we know, worked hard and they believed that the products of their labor belonged to the individual producer, which is the basic idea of the free market economy. Right. Uh -oh. hey! <laughs> this scenic estate on the Hudson River, just north of New York City, provides an ideal setting for person-to-person -person interaction, for those who are perhaps new to the freedom philosophy. Suppose one of you were offered a job that had wonderful working conditions. The young are often among those to whom the principles of freedom are new. For that reason, the fee staff have developed programs to take free market economic education into the colleges and high schools, with speakers willing to talk to entire student bodies, classes, or small discussion groups. And FEE continues to reach young people through its undergraduate seminars, correspondence, debate materials, essay contests, and attractively priced books. What makes FEE different from other organizations dedicated to promoting the free society? Not just the length of time that it has been active, not just the quantity and quality of its publications, not just the seminars and classes that it presents, but its insistence on fundamental self-education and application. Rather than directly confront the people who imply that a free society can't work, the fee approach is to help individuals confront the ideas that are contrary to liberty by emphasizing the importance of basic philosophy and principled economic understanding. 
Only individual change can truly change society. Freedom is not licentiousness. Uh, freedom is acting in a moral or a responsible sense. Because to the degree that free will is exerted without a, res a sense of responsibility, then instead of expanding freedom, uh, freedom is destroyed. The Foundation for Economic Education, through its many program activities, is dedicated to individual freedom of choice, private property, and the free market economy, which makes it possible. Thousands of people all over the country support our efforts. We sincerely hope that you will join forces with these many freedom devotees and let us send you a sampling of our materials. Simply write to us and we'll send you our monthly journal, The Freeman, along with descriptive material about our activities. Please write to Foundation for Economic Education, 30 South Broadway, Irvington, New York, 10533. Thank you.